have all gathered here to have a session with Dr. Tariq Rahman, who will deliver his lecture on language policy in British India. Dr. Tariq Rahman is a Pakistani academic, columnist, and an intellectual, who is author of so many books and other publications, mainly in the field of linguistics. He has been awarded several national and international awards in recognition of his research and scholarly work. May I now request our worthy chief guest, Dr. Tariq Rahman, to please come and deliver his lecture on the topic language policy in British India. I too wanted to see this uh, uh, great institution, historically great, and now great because you are all here and you are the future of this institution. The past of, of this institution you know very well. The most uh, illustrious um, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. But the future is you. And the maker of this future and the present is the faculty, the Vice Chancellor who has actually pioneered this institution and of course the HEC which grants the possibility of pioneering it. So um, I'm emphasizing this last thing because Many people are despondent about the present and the future of Pakistan. There are many um, bad things happening, but there are also many good things happening. We must have a look at both. But for young people to have a bright aspiration for tomorrow, you must also look more at the brighter things. For us scholars, we look at the less bright things, but we are historians. But you must look at the more bright things to be inspired further and not to give up. With this, I come to uh, this uh, lecture. <coughs> now, why do you especially uh, need a lecture on British language policies? The reason is that history is a guide to the future. You need this lecture because if you understand the past, you will then understand why there are certain policies prevalent now and what possibilities are there to understand them to change the negative aspects of them and to capitalize on the positive aspects for them for the future. So that is why this lecture is a historical lecture. I am a, uh, actually a linguistic historian and I write on uh, uh, language politics and a few other things, etc. But uh, to understand the past, we must understand a development of history as related to various aspects, economy for instance, um, commerce for instance. Uh, art, for instance, and language also. Language plays a tremendous part in your education. That is why the emphasis on language, I think, is foremost. <coughs> okay. So now, transport yourselves back to something like the end of the 18th century, 1780. The British uh, are powerful, have established themselves in Calcutta, and Calcutta is the center of the empire. That is the main city. Delhi, of course, comes later, 1910. Calcutta is the uh, uh, center of the empire, the British Empire in India. Remember that by 1780, Delhi was not, had not been conquered. Delhi was conquered in 1803, and the Punjab, etc., uh, uh, even later than that, in um, uh, 1849, etc., and they moved to Sindh also later. So this part was not under British control in 1780. So, so 1780, suppose you are there and you are British and you have um, established your rule over, over India. Uh, I don't know what kind of policies you would have. Think about it. Perhaps your policy would be that you would impose English. Perhaps it would be to use the languages of the country. And perhaps it would be to use the old Mughal language uh, of rule, which was Persian. So, uh, those who want to impose English, raise your hands, just raise your hands quietly, as British, okay. Those who want to impose the local languages, their hand, lots many people. And those who impose, uh, want to continue with Persian, they raise your hands, less. So, local languages actually more. But the British didn't do that. They initially continued with Persian. So all the letters of uh, the British officers to the uh, different Rajas, Maharajas and the Mughal Emperor who was in Delhi were in Persian they, and they learned Persian for it. 
Later on, different things came. We are going to talk about it. So there are two phases actually. The Orientalist phase and in that there is the, then there is the uh, other phase which is going to come later and that uh, we are going to talk about it later. The first, the Orientalist phase. The Orientalist phase is that phase in which the British continued with the previous languages, the Oriental or Eastern languages. For instance, uh, Persian as the language of rule, Arabic as a sacred language for Muslims, and, and uh, Sanskrit as a sacred language for Hindus. So they continued with this. <coughs> they did not continue with any language uh, for Sindh because they didn't rule Sindh at this time. They also did not continue for any language with the, in the, um, uh, the Punjab because, again, they did not rule the Punjab at this time. So this is only for that part of India where they ruled. India was seen as a mysterious East, you know, something with, with a mystery, something with a um, uh, lot of poetry and uh, old history, etc. So it was not looked down upon. So the, in the early 18th century, Indians in India were seen as mysterious and were not looked down upon. Nobody said, okay, you're inferior here. No. They were seen as mysterious. They had been defeated militarily, all right. But more than that, they had been defeated slowly because of the internal divisions between them. So the British did not at that time look upon them as inferior people. That came later. In those days, there were people like Sir William Jones, uh, who came as a judge, uh, 1746 to 1794. He was an expert on Persian. He was also in. Uh, he knew. He knew Sanskrit also. He knew Arabic also. And he, because of his knowledge of languages, he learnt these languages from the Malvis and the um, pundits in India. Uh, although he has he had learnt them earlier um, in in England also, um, but he learnt them more here. And he is one of the first to have made the Hindu code of laws for personal law, the laws of Manu. And he also wrote one of the first um, compendiums of Muslim law, uh, Muslim personal law, uh, because he knew Arabic and Persian. <coughs> Warren Hastings uh, was a governor general, and he was one of the great patrons of this Orientalist phase. Warren Hastings um, uh, was... Um, uh, indicted later in England uh, for uh, for his corruption, and he was called an Nabob because the British in those days used to be corrupt uh, in India. Later on, they did not remain corrupt, but this was the initial phase. Can you imagine which institution he made first? For whom was this institution? Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, anybody? Can you imagine? How many do you think that they he made he made the first educational institution in India for Muslims? Raise your hands. One, two, three, four, very few. For Hindus, not many. Uh, uh, for Sikhs, no. Actually, it was Calcutta Madrasa, 1781, and this was for Muslims. So, uh, th this institution was made first. The reason was that Warren Hastings uh, personally was uh, much involved in Arabic and Persian studies, Persian especially. Uh, Arabic less, but Persian most. And he was also a great admirer of um, Sir William Jones. And uh, William Jones was also more uh, interested in Persian and Arabic. So he, it was his personal effort. It was not necessarily for a political reason, although politics might be involved, but actually it was because his tremendous deep interest was in these kind of classical studies. But of course, there was a political angle. The Hindus were more in number. Muslims were just about 14%. So uh, he also uh, ordered that the Hindu colleges at Nadia and Tirhut should be made. They were made also. Fort William College was made in 1800, and this was made to teach British officers. This was not for Indians. There were Indian munshis in it who were teachers, but this was basically to teach uh, the um, uh, you know British. And uh, the, this Urdu, the first grammar of Urdu is written by the British, you know, this was made over here. There was an Urdu department here. This was called the Hindustani department. And uh, there was a professorship of Persian. There was a prof professorship of Arabic. And incidentally, the professorship of Arabic was the highest paid. The, uh, in, uh, in 1802, the, uh, there's a list given in the India office. And that says that the salary of the professor of Arabic was 2,600 rupees, which was extremely high salary in those days. 
uh, I mean, British officers otherwise did not draw that much salary. The commander in chief of the army drew that much salary, but it was an extremely high salary, next almost to the uh, uh, to the uh, viceroy and higher than the secretaries, uh, federal secretaries. This was very high uh, salary. The professorship of Persian had a lower salary, and uh, other uh, of, of Hindustani, etc. That was a, and Bengali that had a lower, much lower salary. But this was a very high salary, just to show the esteem in which Arabic was put by them. The professorship of Sanskrit had a high salary too. I don't remember just now what it was. Lower than Arabic, but pretty high. <coughs> Next one. So the policy uh, is at that time as written in the letters, uh, in the policy documents, was that we have kept in view the peculiar circumstances of our political relations with India, which having necessarily transferred all power and preeminence from native to European agency, have rendered it incumbent upon us from motives of policy, as well as from a principle of justice, to consult the feelings and even to, the, to yield to the prejudices of the natives. Basically, what the British uh, policy is, what it is saying is that if policy, if possible, consult the natives, consult their prejudices, that means their feelings, and consult their, uh, uh, um, you know, interest, ask them. Do not annoy unnecessarily. But the basic policy is consolidation of the British Empire. The British Empire must be consolidated, but with as little effort as possible. So, if possible, conciliate people. If they are not conciliated, well, you can resort to harsher means, but basically conciliate people. That means all policy should be evolutionary. No, it is not necessary to browbeat people into acceptance of um, the English language straight away or any other thing which they don't want straight away. And that is why there is a, this 1780 to 1835 is an interval huge interval in which new policies were taking shape. Now the other policy which was being, which was taking shape was um, uh, the uh, Anglicist policy. This was taking shape, this was the future. Why? Because there was a change of perception about the East, about the Orient in England. As I told you, the earlier perception was that it is a land of mystery, it is a land with a past, and it is, it is to be respected for its past. The new kind of feeling was that Indian civilization is uh, 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 backward and, and ignorant and uh, full of idleness, and there may be poetry and uh, uh, books uh, uh, of various kinds of beliefs, Hinduism, Islam, and so on, but not science, not certain knowledge, and therefore this must be uh, done away with and it should be replaced with uh, British uh, language, English language, and the kind of knowledge which is made in England. <clears throat> so this is Charles Grant and he's, he wrote a book, uh, Observations, 1792, and he said, the first communication of light and the instrument when introducing the rest must be the English language. This is the key which will open to them a world of new ideas and policy alone might have impelled us long since to put it into their hands. Now look at the, uh, the, the language. The language is that which is later on called the white man's burden. That is, it is the duty of the civilized white man to bring people up to the level to which the West has attained by then. So you must remember what is their point of view. Their point of view is the two. One is that the British Empire must be consolidated. Okay. This, we are ruling and we must consolidate our rule, which is obviously every ruler wants that. The second one is that we are more civilized. We've got uh, certain knowledge, science, etc. And therefore, we must help these people to come up to that level. <coughs> this was opposed. It did not go unopposed. There were people who said, Look, if we start teaching English to Indians, we will bring ideas of liberty, fraternity, equality, uh, rights, and so on. The political ideas are democracy and constitutionalism. Now, how can you introduce the idea of democracy in a state which is ruled by us? Because the first thing they are going to say is, why are you ruling us? This is not democracy, you go away. 
we rule ourselves. So this is going to bring about a revolution against us in India. Therefore, we should not teach them English. After all, uh, the ideas uh, of the French Revolution and the ideas of the American Revolution are all in English. Indians will read them and then they will revolt against us. So it is foolishness to teach them English. This, this was the Orientalist lobby's defense. The uh, Anglicist lobby said that, uh, you see, uh, the ideas of, uh, um, of rebellion are in uh, both Hindus and Muslims, because after all, we are Christians. So the ideas of rebellion are already there. If we teach them, if we don't teach them, the ideas of rebellion will not die. On the other hand, they will not be exposed to new knowledge and will not learn that this new knowledge is good for them. If they find out that this new knowledge is good to them and they work for us, etc., after learning English, then many of them, their fortunes will be tied to our fortunes and they will want the British government to remain to protect those fortunes. Therefore, we should teach them English. Actually, both proved to be correct. What happened was that the new uh, uh, younger um, generation of Indians, they were loyal to the British also, but at the same time, within the same class were people, uh, and uh, Mr. Jena was one of them, but there were people earlier also, uh, in the Congress, for instance, uh, and then later on the Muslim, who also wanted the British to go away on the same grounds, the same British grounds, the same grounds of um, democracy, uh, representation, and ruled by the native and not by the foreigner. So th this was also true. The other part also proved to be true because a lot many uh, Indians who were dependent, uh, had read English, etc., had got British values in those days did not think that the British would leave so easily and remain loyal to the British because their fortunes were tied to the British in jobs, in the civil service, in the army and elsewhere, etc., in the universities elsewhere. They remained loyal almost till the end. So both ideas proved to be true. Now I come to the third thing that uh, Wilberforce's pious clause uh, suggested the school missionaries and uh, schoolmasters and missionaries should be sent to India. Now you see, Schoolmasters and missionaries had not been allowed up to this time. Reason? Because they felt that if schoolmasters come, they will start teaching ideas about uh, enlightenment and democracy and this and that, etc., because those are European ideas. So what's the use of getting schoolmasters here? And secondly, missionaries, because missionaries are going to spread Christianity. And if they spread Christianity, it is possible that the navels, uh, natives will not like it and they will rebel. Why should we, we are, after all, these people are pretty, as yet, there is no major rebellion. Why should we have a major rebellion in our hands by allowing missionaries? But Wilberforce, this was a man, you know, Wilberforce was an even um, evangelist Christian. He was also the man who um, allowed slaves to be free, not allowed, persuaded the parliament to pass acts by which slaves became free in Jamaica and elsewhere, where they were employed in, to, um, uh, to make sugar. So, so, and he did not, he also persuaded the parliament to sign an act that there will be no import of slaves in England. So, slaves were imported in America but not in England. So, Wilberforce had this, he was a man of tremendous conscience, but he was a very, very uh, pious um, um, uh, kind of a Christian. So, in that, he gave what the clause which he gave is called the pious clause because of his personal piety. He said that, you see, if you don't allow uh, school masters uh, and you don't teach English then all the things which I told you earlier these are going to come to pass and secondly he said that if you don't allow uh, missionaries you will have to spend much more money on the other school masters because they charge a lot of money I mean they go from here to etc missionaries on the other hand don't charge much money and the church is responsible for them we are not going to pay them right first is this saving and secondly Wilberforce also said that uh, uh, after all, we have so many uh, English people in India. We have, um, and uh, it is uh, our right to have a church in India, some churches in India. And you can't have a church unless you have a priest in it. And therefore, we require uh, these people, not only for the natives, but for ourselves also. And uh, thirdly, he said that 
this is an unheard of cruelty and injustice that people who are of our faith should be allowed just because they are priests. This is, this is not on. And this is supposed to be a Christian country and India is supposed to be ruled by us. And then we don't allow missionaries. So eventually missionaries were allowed. But you see, the, 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 the British officers were not supposed to encourage missionaries. They were supposed to protect them in case of danger. So uh, it, is, it is not true to say that the British deliberately spread Christianity in India. They didn't. The missionaries did. The British government in India never did so. And yet, those who oppose missionaries proved to be correct also. Because in 1857 and earlier than that in 1803, there were two rebellions. And in both rebellions, etc., one of the great charges against the British government in India was that they were, um, they were promoting, uh, you know, uh, promoting Christianity. And this was because missionaries were available everywhere. And they were indulging in debates and so on. That was the reason why missionaries were opposed. Now, why did English enter India? Well, this is crucial for you because, uh, you see, uh, one of the things which affected all of us is the introduction of English in India. And it affects us even now here in Pakistan as well as in India, uh, now in uh, present-day India. See, this was the, the British did not impose English upon India. They rationed out English. Ration out, I'll explain just now. They were also Indian uh, initiatives for acquiring English. And why? Because to impose means that you pass a law that you must read this language alone, and that is all. No. Rationing out means that you create market conditions because of which if you don't acquire a language, you don't get good jobs. Right? So the market was created by the policies of that period. And among them was that in 1774, the Supreme Court was established in Calcutta. Now, the Supreme Court uh, uh, was functioning in English, not in Persian. It needed clerks to write. It needed other people to, to function in English. So, and it needed translation of documents. So, translators were required, clerks were required. They had to learn English. And, uh, you know, the, to import them from England was very difficult, very costly. To train them in India was much easier. So they were trained in India. And that is how, uh, and uh, of course people found that, you know, the Supreme Court pays well. So the, in, in Calcutta, both the Hindus and the Muslims wanted to be employed in the Supreme Court. And that is how English got a foothold first, privately. Then in 1816, the natives of Calcutta themselves subscribed to establish an Anglo-Indian college. Not created by the British. It was created because there was just 10,000 pounds which were to be spread on education. They were already being spent on the Calcutta Madrasa and the Hindu colleges and so on, and there wasn't much money. So the natives themselves contributed in 1816. They subscribed to establish an Anglo-Indian college, and uh, they, they, here an English class was held. Then there were people like David Hare, uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, uh, and later on um, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. They encouraged Indians to learn English. In 1832, a parliamentary committee recommended that Indians should be employed in the civil service and taught English. Civil services of various kinds, you know, you were used to only one. That is the covenanted civil service. The higher civil service was used to be called the ICS later. But uh, the civil service is all the clerks and everybody else who works for government. All of them are the civil service. So actually, uh, all school teachers are also civil servants. You know, government school teachers are all civil servants. All clerks are civil servants. And people who work for the post office, people who work for trains, etc., all of them are civil servants. In fact, all those who are taking money from the state, okay, uh, and not wearing on a, uh, putting on a uniform, were civil servants with the exception of universities, which were autonomous bodies even then. But they had not been formed. The first university was formed in 1858, the University of Calcutta. Okay. <coughs> Colleges were civil servants, the lecturers. So this, it, this parliament, this is the one I was talking about, it's a huge book, I mean it's a huge report. And in that they, uh, 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 they recommended that uh, universities should be created and that Indians should be em uh, employed because it is impossible to take so many Englishmen from here, it's just too costly. And so uh, the, the Indian initiative, uh, first of course the Hindus and then the Muslims, so Sayyid Ahmed started a campaign in 1870s. His survey of 1872 found that Muslims were anti-English. So he also created this. <coughs> Fast forward to 
Finally, the English is one out. I told you one because in England the philosophy had changed. The worldview was that, you know, the Orient is mysterious and so on. And now the philosophy was that the Orient is actually uh, backward and slow. And uh, therefore, um, we must form uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, we must bring the Orient up. <coughs> and, you know, one reason for that, one reason f was the uh, Industrial Revolution in England. There's a big difference between the way agricultural people uh, work and the way um, uh, n n these kind of societies, that is, uh, society is running on industry, they work. You see, in agriculture, the sun comes up, etc., you go to the fields, but it's, you're not ruled by a watch. You're not ruled by a clock. And there are long instances where you can sleep in the summer, you have a siesta, and uh, you're not ruled by precise seconds. Whereas in the industry, if a machine starts running, it is extremely precise because it's an instrument. And if you are not precise over there, you will cut your hand. It will come in the machine. So the, it starts at a certain time and it ends at a certain time. So in, the schools also started functioning as the model of the factory, and schools also started at a certain time and ending at a certain time, so the British were much more disciplined, right? And much more, uh, they, you, you know, why Eastern people uh, are, uh, generally it is true, that they don't come in time, etc., is because they are used to the agricultural rhythm. It is in their culture. Whereas the industrial rhythm is a fast rhythm, and it is precise, so people are on time. So, well, anyway, the Anglicists won the victory. And in 1828, uh, Macaulay's minute actually refers to this, because his is the, in 1835, when he signed this thing, he, um, uh, uh, 2nd February 1835, his minute. I don't know how many of you have read it, but uh, uh, Macaulay's minute uh, argues in the same way. He says that the future is of science and modernity, and it is our duty to bring Eastern people up to that level. Secondly, he says that all higher education, all, all this money for higher education should be spent on the teaching of English. Higher education should be through the medium of English. And we may have some schools for the Indian elite, the Nawabs, etc., and uh, great landlords, uh, uh, which teach in English. But the last paragraph says that we cannot afford to teach. Afford is my word. He says... No government can teach every, all uh, children in uh, uh, English. It is not possible. It is too costly. So the vernacular languages of India will be used to, as medium of instruction, media of instruction in schools. Now remember this, because you have got the same policy now. Teach the elite in English. Higher education should be in English. Some schools, uh, etc., attended by the elite should be in English but everything else should be in the vernacular of the province, uh, which it was mostly Urdu, um, in, in uh, Punjab and UP at least, uh, but which was uh, in Sindh, it was Sindhi. Okay. So T.B. Macaulay, who came in 1823, became president of the GCPI, General Committee of um, Public Instruction. He passed this minute, and this became the law. So the government policy, which was announced on 7th of March 1835, stated... The great object of the British government ought to be the promotion of European literature and science among the natives of India. All funds appropriated for the purpose of education would be best employed on English education alone. That is higher education, not the school one. <coughs> the Orientalists protested against this. And in, um, you know, they, how uh, uh, I know about it is because I read the diary of one of the uh, secretaries of the uh, secretaries of that time, and he was against. He was in the um, Orientalist lobby. He was against the Anglicists. So he says, in three days, a petition was got up and signed by no less than thirty thousand people on behalf of the um, Calcutta Madrasa and other by the Hindus for the Sanskrit College. T. B. Macaulay took it into his head that this agitation was excited, even got up by me. So he considered it. Uh, you know, uh, politics went on at that time also, like it always does. He thought it was, he was writing against uh, Lord Macaulay, and Lord Macaulay, of course, was writing against him. In 1853, H.H. Wilson said to a select committee of the House of Commons that the Muslims feared that the government wanted to convert people to um, Christianity. 1853, he had already warned people. 1857 uh, came the great movement, but 1853 he had warned already because everything had, you know, higher education was now in English, 
and they were fierce. And uh, in his letter, 9th April 1834, Trevelyan, who was a civil servant, wrote to Lord, Lord Bentick, the abolition of the exclusive privileges which the Persian language has in the courts and affairs of the court will form the crowning stroke which will shake Hinduism and Mohammedanism to the center and firmly establish our language, our learning, and ultimately our religion in India. Now, uh, uh, remember, this is one civil servant's letter to the, um, uh, you know, to the, to, the, to, the, to the head of the government. It is not the policy of the British government in India as a whole. So when he says that he is, the, he is happy that Hinduism and uh, Islam will be destroyed, it is his personal view. This is not the policy of the British government. I am emphasizing this because some of your history books I have read have quoted these lines and said that the British policy was this. This is not true. Actually, Trevelyan was, uh, Lord Bentick did not answer. And secondly, Trevelyan was posted out quietly. He was sent back to India because the secret report on him was that uh, this officer behaves more uh, like a priest than an officer. And uh, he should uh, be better um, employed in his retirement in a church. This is what Lord Bentick actually wrote. So nothing was said to him, but he was just quietly transferred and then retired. Because he was considered too zealous. Civil servants were not dismissed. But they were quietly retired and sent back. They were made officers of, you know, on special duty, etc. So he was given his salary for the next two years. And then uh, finally... Uh, nobody told him anything, but he was quietly waved a goodbye, everybody gave him a good cup of tea, and nobody wrote that actually the report is against you, because you have been acting like a priest. But this I am emphasizing that, uh, uh, because this was not the British policy, the British policy was only one, consolidation of the empire, and anything which was harmful to that was not allowed. So, And they understood even in 1853 that if you uh, are trying to convert people en masse, both Hindus and Muslims, you're not going to rule for long. So this was not British policy. <coughs> okay. So uh, English came in the domains of power. What are the domains of power? Those which in a modern state control the country, its administration, judiciary, military, um, uh, and uh, media and commerce and so on. So the higher administration, the civil service, the higher, higher judiciary, the high court and the supreme court, officer corps of the armed forces, higher and elitist education, um, for instance, universities, media uh, and commerce, higher domains were all in English. And that is why anyone who wanted to get a higher kind of job had to learn English. Okay. These were the early Muslim students of English. And I've, this was very difficult to get. I got this from many places. Vidyala Anglo-Indian College, 1816, there was establishment of an English class. In uh, Hooghly, uh, Imam, Imam Bara, 1824, 60 Muslim boys read English out of a total of 83. Agra College, 1828, an English class was um, uh, introduced in Agra. Calcutta, Madrasa, 1827. Other things being equal, the knowledge of English gave some advantage to students. Delhi College, it was decided to... <coughs> It was decided to introduce English, that has been cut off. Merit-free school, 21 Europeans, 18 boys and 3 girls also, 1829. 16 Hindu boys, 34 Muslim boys were studying English and Persian. A Chinsura free school, 1929 English grammar was taught to 64 boys, 30 to 40 being Hindus and 6 girls. Sindh Masatul Islam, Karachi, here, 1885, one of the earliest in this whole what we call West Pakistan, what we call Pakistan now, Pioneered English studies in sin. So you are in history. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, the normal, uh, normal feeling is that the Muslim, uh, uh, you know, uh, Malvis had given a fatwa against English and that they called Sir Sayyid a kafir because he uh, was for the teaching of English. This is not true. The fatwa, uh, the, at the highest uh, order, the fatwa, I've quoted this from Fatwa Rizviya uh, and then Shah Abdul Aziz fatwa. This is the, these are the original. Shah Abdul Aziz was, was one of the greatest uh, of the Muslim um, uh, thinkers and uh, sort of um, um, scholars of the 18th century, uh, uh, Shah Waliullah's son. This is what he writes. There is no harm in reading English. I'm, you see, this is in Persian. 
and I have tried to uh, be as true to the original as possible. So uh, there is no harm in reading English, i.e. recognizing English alphabet, writing it and knowing its terms and meanings, provided that this knowledge is gained for intentions which are lawful to Islam. The Hadith says that Zayd bin Thabit, in accordance to the orders uh, of uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, learned the art of both the Jewish and Christian scripts and languages. However, it is undesirable and illegal to learn English with the intention of flattering Englishmen and getting their favor. This is what Shah Abdul Aziz said. And the, uh, the original in Persian, and then I have also used other fatawa. So none of the great, uh, you know, uh, fatawa of that period, uh, plural of fatwa is uh, fatawa, none of the fatawa of that period were against English. However, there was a general prejudice against English. This was spread by many people, even the ordinary mosque Malvi or just otherwise people. My, as for instance, Deputy Nazir Ahmed says, my father said clearly that he would rather have me die, have me beg in the street, but would not tolerate teaching me English. So, but this is a general um, prejudice spread by uh, Malvi's here and there, not backed by any of the great fatawa of the age. So it is not true to say that they, the ulama did not allow it, and they did. But the ordinary Malvis and ordinary people uh, among Muslims were against it. That is true also. The ordinary pundits were also against it. But again, there was no great, no great Hindu scholar had said that there is anything wrong with studying English. But ordinary people here and there, etc., did say it. <coughs> what was the British interest in promoting English? I am quoting purely from them, from their sources. Uh, these are letters. And they have been uh, put in one place by Ritchie, 1922. First, to secure to us a larger and more certain supply of many articles necessary for our manufacturers. One. Second, as a market of an almost inexhaustible demand for the produce of British labor. Third, English education was to raise the moral character of Indians. Anglicization was to supply servants to whose probity office of trust may be given. These are the four stated aims. All of them. And uh, the idea was that if people learn, you know, um, uh, English, etc., uh, then maybe they are going to have British kind of taste and, you know, clothes and this and that, etc., tables and chairs, etc., our products will be sold better. We will have a bigger, bigger market. One. Second, uh, 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 the same thing is number two, that the whatever we produce in England, will be considered as uh, Indian market is huge. So if we produce chairs, England, the, um, the consumption of chairs is less because the population is less. But if an Indian start consuming it, even only in the upper classes, look at the number of chairs which will be sold. And then um, this was a moral aim. The idea was, as I told you before, white man's burden to raise the moral. They thought it would raise the moral character of Indians because they felt that the moral character is low. People take bribes and lie and this and that, etc. And then the idea was, although by the way, by this time, at this time, up to 1850s, the British also took bribes. And they were extremely corrupt. One strange thing is, at this time, they were called the Nabobs. Every British governor general, major ones, Lord Clive and uh, others, etc., Warren Hastings, were all tried for uh, corruption in England. Later on, uh, British uh, officers were so honest that uh, Field Marshal Lord Wavell, he writes, and he was, uh, he was one of the viceroys of India, the second last viceroy of India, he writes that uh, in his journal that my wife is looking for a flat in London and I don't like to live in flats, but we can't afford to live in a house. So, and he is a, a Field Marshal, Field Marshal doesn't retire, and he's also um, the viceroy of India. He is retired as Viceroy of India. He doesn't have enough money to live in. Out of the six field marshals which the British had at the end of the Second World War, four chose to live out of England because they couldn't afford to live in England. Right. So this is the standard of honesty towards the end. But when the British Empire was rising, the empire was officers were dishonest. When it was falling, the officers were very honest. In hundred years' time, a miraculous change had occurred. The universities had, which the universities of Oxford and Cambridge used to be extremely corrupt, they became honest and straight. Uh, the church became honest and straight. And uh, boroughs were no longer bought and sold. 
commissions in the army and the navy were no longer bought and sold. You had to work to get your commission. And in the civil service um, uh, also, examinations were held. The civil service posts were not for sale. All these things disappeared within 100 years, a little more, 150 years, let's say. But by 1857, when the, uh, when the East India Company rule ended and the Queen started ruling, etc., in name, actually the uh, Prime Ministers used to rule, uh, British officers became more and more honest till by the 1930s no officer except a bribe a British officer meant that he wouldn't accept a bribe and that uh, uh, they had very little money once they went back to England and they generally her, um, uh, the joke is um, her ladyship used to be um, boiling potatoes because they couldn't uh, afford a servant and uh, somebody has wrote about the uh, governor of uh, this place, Bombay, when it was part of the British, that they, he went to treat Lord Wellington. And Lord Wellington, Lady Wellington had boiled potatoes and Lord Wellington served them. They couldn't afford a servant and they couldn't afford meat. So this is how, uh, I mean, they had one leg piece for everyone, chicken leg piece, just one, because they couldn't afford more than three. So this is how British officers had become by, by, by uh, 1936. Earlier, extreme corruption. <coughs> okay, but the reasons for that, this is not the time for it. Okay. Elitist schooling was introduced, which was in English, as was part of Macaulay's Minute. Rajkumar College, Mayo College, Rajkumar College, Nogong, Delhi College, Edison College, Lahore. Uh, European schools were introduced also. European schools were for the bureaucracy uh, and the military. In 1938-39, there were 146 schools with 24,511 students, of whom 5,596 were Indian. The average fee was Rs. 188 per year, whereas that of a vernacular school, Urdu medium or Sindhi medium, was minimum 2 rupees per year. So you see, the English education had to be bought, which meant either the elite of power could take it, or the elite of money could take it. And it was rationed out because in these European schools, only up to 15% Indians were allowed. Others, even if they had the money, were not allowed because the quota was 15%. And in, as far as the Rajkumar College and the great colleges were concerned, in HSN, etc., if you were not the son of a landlord, you couldn't get any. So it was rationed out. Now, from what we have learned from them is that English, a market was created was English in which the elite could prosper and that English was not imposed but rationed out, and that it was the language of higher education, but that the language of schools was mostly, unless they were elite schools, mostly the vernacular language of the country. This meant that English became a barrier to rise in one's life. You had to cross that barrier and pass in English to go up. Was that what happened to Pakistan and India later? Yes, the policy continues. But the constitution says otherwise. The constitution says the national language of Pakistan is Urdu and arrangement shall be made for its being used for official and other purposes within 15 years from the commencing day and subject to clause A, the English language may be used for official purposes until arrangements are made for its replacement by Urdu. And even uh, last to last year, the Supreme Court passed an order that this should be done. It has still not been done, this time given to the government. The, as far as the policy of schooling is, uh, is there, the old policy still continues, which is that uh, uh, there are, uh, the, for most of the um, government schools, the language of instruction is the vernacular of the province, which is uh, in, uh, at least in rural parts of Sindh, which is Sindhi, and uh, in uh, uh, Punjab, it is Urdu. And uh, NWFP or uh, KP, as it is called, it is still Urdu. And uh, um, AK, it is Urdu. And uh, Balochistan, parts, it is Urdu, not Balochi. And uh, for the uh, elite, it is English. So there are private English medium schools, and they're the same old colleges, HSN college kind of colleges are there. They have multiplied. They are called also, in addition to those kind of colleges, they are called. Uh, they are patronized by the army and they are called, uh, they are called cadet colleges. That policy is there. The army has got a much higher role than the British times, but uh, the army is uh, basically patronizes English education, that is elite education. Now, before I come to the conclusion, one last thing. 
uh, you will be wondering why is it that uh, the uh, language of the vernacular language in Sindh used to be Sindhi in British times. It was recognized as Sindhi. But in the Punjab, it was not Punjabi. It was Urdu. In the frontier, it was not Pashto. It was Urdu. Why? You would be wondering about this. And in Bengal, it was Bengali. So why have Sindh and Bengal? I mean, did the British like the Bengalis and the Sindhis more that they patronize their languages? That is not the reason. The reason is, go back to the first thing. Consolidation of the empire. Okay. The, in Bengal, when Persian was removed, there were reasons for promoting Bengali. One reason was that uh, by this time, the first to take advantage, because they had studied more anyway, were Hindus. And uh, obviously they studied more, they took advantage of it. Secondly, they were powerful Hindu landlords in uh, Bengal. <coughs> so it, it stood to reason that if you promote this language, after Persian is gone, etc., it will consolidate the empire more because more people are going to be with you. So they, uh, uh, they uh, promoted Bengali in the Bengali script. One result of this was that Muslims, uh, uh, clerks, munshis, etc., who did not know the script, knew the language because they spoke it, but they did not know the uh, script, were thrown out of their jobs. And if you have seen this uh, hunter, uh, you know, this, uh, this, these, these, these reports, especially it's quoted in your book, Hunter, under the name of William Hunter. He writes that uh, Muslims could hardly be poor in the ancient days and now they can hardly be rich. And all this is about Bengal. It is not about Punjab. It's not about Sindh. It's not about Punjab. It's not about these. It's just Bengal. In UP, on the other hand, Muslims had an advantage. They were only 14%, but in jobs, they were more in number than their percentage allowed. For instance, they were 49% in the police, the Daroga. And the Nawabs and uh, Taluk Edars were very high in uh, number. Lucknow's Nawab are well known. So this is not true about other places. This is only true about, uh, about that area. In Sindh, what had happened? In Sindh, Sindhi was written earlier than that. Sindhi, uh, I mean, was, was written e even from the uh, 14th century. The, and even earlier, maybe, there are manzoom. Uh, that is to say, poetic forms in which Islam is taught to people and then uh, certain stories, kissas, etc. are said and then there is poetry, a lot of poetry uh, in uh, Shah Jorisalo for instance, but that is just one, there is other poetry also. All this was written in a modified form of Arabic script. All this was there. So already the Sindhi language was used very much in civilizational roles. It was not, uh, Sindhi was in fact a highly developed language, it was not uh, something which was uh, you know, uh, uh, it was not a village language. It was a highly developed form and it had a lot of literature in it, good literature in it, okay, and Sufi literature in it. So that when the British came, they saw this and they knew that, of course, the Talpur uh, rulers used Farsi, but they knew that Sindhi is highly developed. They had read it, of course. So they had uh, one, op they had several uh, options. One was to use one of the Brahmi script. Um, you know, variants of Sindhi, which was called the Hindu Sindhi, and the other one was to use the Muslim Sindhi. They chose the Muslim one because the landlords in Sindhu were mostly Muslim. The cities were dominated by, by Hindus, all right, but the landlords had tremendous power, and uh, the British wanted good relationship with them. So they, they chose this. They made a committee called the Ellis Committee, which created these present graphemes of Sindhi, the alphabet which you see, they standardized it. But it's not that it was not there before, it was there. The British didn't create Sindhi. They simply standardized it. And this was a committee where both Hindus and Muslims are present. The British officer was just one. <coughs> okay. That is how Sindhi became then the vernacular language, which means it was the language of the lower courts. It was the language of schools. It was the language of uh, um, journalism, and it was the language of every day-to-day -day life. It was uh, uh, Sindhi was replaced by Urdu only after 1951. Sindhi schools were replaced by Urdu medium schools in Karachi, etc., and the big cities of Sindh only after 1951. So Sindhi was a huge presence. It was not something small. 
and this uh, so it was not uh, that uh, Sindhi and Bengali that there was no special uh, favor to these people but it simply it was in British interest to promote them because it consolidated the empire least, least resistance <coughs> one secondly there was some resistance from Hindus once the British established the Muslim script as the only script which would get them jobs so the British allowed a Hindu script also they allowed a Hindu script you said, okay, we'll teach a Hindu script, we'll have some schoolmasters who teach it in the schools, but there'll be no jobs in it. And the script died. Why? Because there were no jobs in it. Unless there are jobs, the script dies. So the Hindus were taught, if they wanted to teach their children a Hindu script, good. They could learn it. But the Hindus of Sindh decided not to do so. Why? Because their children would be left out of jobs. Or they would have to learn two scripts, and that means more effort. Uh, and so that is why this was the position of Sindh. Punjab was different. When the British conquered the Punjab in 1849, most of the officers, they wrote to officers, and the officers were prejudiced against Punjabi. They said, no, this is just a dialect, this is an inferior language, and this and that, etc. So this, this, and some of them also wrote, three of them wrote, that this is, the script is sacred to the six, and uh, we don't want to promote a, a language which is a, a script which is sacred to the Sikhs. But only three officers. The rest of them all were biased against it. So the main reason was bias against Punjabi. And in the frontier, the political reasons, because the British officers wrote that if you promote Pashto, the Pashtuns are going to look towards Kabul. If you want them to look towards Lahore and towards Delhi, then promote Urdu. So they used Urdu over there. So there were political reasons for doing so. But you see different reasons. So what emerges is not that there was one, one factor emerges, that the consolidation of the empire. The other different policies are followed for different reasons in all the different parts of India. Now I come to the final one. The British language policy was to use English in the domains of power. Justice Persian was used earlier. In the lower domains of power, however, they used the vernacular language of the province, which, as in the case of the Punjab and present-day KP, was not the mother tongue of the people necessarily. They promoted Urdu in all these areas, as well as in the area now called UP. The vernacular English controversy initiated by their policies are alive in South Asia today. Thank you. And if you want to ask... <laughs> Thank you.